Okay, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about messaging. Um, you might wonder why this is relevant to gaming. I think it's super relevant. I think actually the, the shifts in the industry, um, particularly in messaging and communications, have massive implications for the future of game publishing, the future of game distribution, and I would encourage you today to think about this and how the sands are shifting, because I think if we don't get in front of it, it's going to dominate us. So, history of game distribution, and this is my own interpretation, there are many different eras within this, but if you think through the larger tectonic shifts in the industry, how games have come to be, how people have gotten their hands on the physical content. First wave, there was always physical. We had cartridges, we had discs, you had to go to a store. Um, you know, if you were lucky, you got one from a friend. There was actual physical media to be consumed. After that, we entered an era of digital, and that's taken a number of different forms. Uh, for casual games, of course, in the early days, there was Real Arcade, there was PopCap in the early days. Remember when you could play a web game and you had to pay $19.99 to download the downloadable version? That was amazing. So digital is still uh, a large, large part of the industry and very important. Within that, we've created kind of a subset, a segment of, of additional business mechanisms for us to collect money for digital content. So DLC, microtransactions, virtual currencies, I would argue this is a, a huge shift within the industry and has changed not just kind of what we sell and how we sell it, but it's fundamentally changed what kinds of teams make games. It's changed who owns rights. It's changed all of the dynamics. Companies have gone out of business, new companies have formed, uh, new cultures around creating games have formed. If you think about the culture at a, a company like Zynga, very, very different culture of making games than maybe if you worked at an old school shooter company or a, a company making casual games. So it changes everything for us. And what's important is to stay on top of that trend. So the question in my mind is what comes next? There have been lots of layoffs over the last year, and they seem, to, they seem to continue every year. But if you look at the numbers, the industry is growing dramatically. So how do you explain those layoffs? And really what it comes down to is a shift in business model, a shift in the way that the industry is working, and the way we think about how to make games, who owns them, who distributes them, and who makes the money. So in the last Newsy report, this, this bit of data really stuck out for me. And that is that in 2013, Apple generated almost identical game revenues to Nintendo. That, to me, is a pretty mind-blowing number. Uh, $2.4 billion to Apple from games, a company that we don't think of as a game company, whereas Nintendo is the very heart of gaming. Uh, those two companies made the same amount of money off games this year, and, and the trend is actually headed towards Apple and towards Google. This year, Google and Apple will make more money from gaming than Nintendo. So regardless of how you feel about that, that's, that's the world we're living in today. So what is the next wave? Because maybe it's not platform, maybe it's not mobile. Everybody talks about mobile, and of course mobile as a platform is very important. But I would argue that within mobile, there is another wave coming that gamers need to consider and that is messaging and communications as a platform. So this is a trend that's been growing very quickly, this idea of an application in which you do all of your communication. Everybody heard about the WhatsApp acquisition. There are many other platforms, and particularly in Asia, these platforms are massive. Now, we think of them as messaging platforms today, but the reality is they have much grander aspirations in many ways. Just as we once thought of Facebook as a platform and a mechanism to talk to our friends or share photos, and then it became a gaming platform, and then many would argue died as a gaming platform, the same may well be true for messaging. And there are a few reasons I believe this. Uh, one is that fundamentally, Gaming is a social endeavor. Uh, according to the ESA, 70% of gamers either play competitively or cooperatively with friends. 70%. So the majority of gamers play with friends in some form or fashion. And I know this very well. My entire career is built on the connections I made playing games. I started out as a pre-law student. I had very serious aspirations to do other things, 
But I was introduced by friends to Doom and then to Quake. We formed a clan, we moved into a house. We, we formed all of these crazy connections around this game that we were super, super passionate about. And we formed community around that. We formed a language and a culture about something we were super excited about. And we made friends all over the country. Um, that has led me to where I am now as VP of Growth at Layer, which is a communications company. We're building communications technology. Uh, our team won Disrupt last year, which is not a gaming competition, but a much larger startup competition. Um, we've got some really impressive folks that built Grand Central, which was uh, Google Voice, OpenDNS, Fox.io, some really cool communications products. But before this, I was actually doing technology for microtransactions and virtual currencies. But this entire career, everything I have built, all these connections, everything that's taken to me to this point was built on these communication tools from the late 90s. I am outing myself as old now. I, uh, this is what I had to work with uh, when I was in college. We had Pine for email, which was spectacular. Uh, we then had IRC, which I adored and loved and spent countless hours and days and years in. And then for my favorite game of the time, Quake, uh, we had the super fancy messaging functionality where you could type a text line into a console and it would beep across to everybody on the server. So these are not sophisticated tools. And yet from this, people got married, people made lifelong friendships. I have lifelong friendships I formed in those tools from people I met purely through those tools and did not meet in person for years after that. But we grew up together, these people got married, they had kids, they became a permanent part of my life through that ultra simplistic communication. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that we connected over content we were passionate about, regardless of the basic tools that surrounded it. And we facil facilitated that communication with those basic tools. So really it comes down to what, how, how do you define communication? I mean, communication can be any number of things. People think of it as I talk to you, I message you, uh, but it goes well beyond that. You know, the, the basic definition is often meaningful exchange of information between people, between machines, between organisms. But really a, a better definition, I think, is, is really the root of the word, which is to make common. It's to make something common. And as a community of gamers, this is something I think we do particularly well, is to make things common, to build ideas together, to build a culture together. And it's those things we build together that have defined who we are and created something that's, that's really actually pretty spectacular. Uh, so what does communication and gaming look like? Sometimes it looks like this. Um, I, I love this, this is just from Best of Twitch, which I love to go on and read because it just entertains me. Um, if I was not a gamer and I went and read this, it's like my, it's not like a, an understandable language. Like, what does this mean to anyone who is not on Twitch chat? What does it mean to someone who has not played games? They probably would have no idea. This is like our own language that we've created. Um, another example, you know, and if you're there, if you're a part of the community, if you spend time there, you understand exactly what this means and the reference that it is and where this person was going with their statement, and you appreciate the humor behind all of it, but it's almost like a joke in a joke in a joke in a joke inside of a reference, and often that's what builds gaming culture. And I love it. So in gaming, we have created that language, we've created our own culture, we've created our own memes, and I think memes are actually really, really important. That in and of itself is a game. It is a metagame throughout our community to build that culture and build those references on top of each other. So perhaps when you think of memes, you think of something that looks like this. A lot of people do. Uh, I would argue a lot of people don't even know what memes are. But if you're, if you're in this room, you know what a meme is. Uh, internet memes are probably your first stop for that. Uh, Jeremy over here and I worked together. We had a boss that had no idea what memes were. We had an incident in which we had created many, we had our own in-jokes, many gaming related. The boss confronted me and said, I don't know what these things are on your wall, but I have a feeling they're offensive. And I said, lolcats, like memes, and just blank. So often no idea, but this is usually what you think of when you think of memes, internet memes. 
Uh, but the reality is memes are much more than that. There's a lot of history behind this term, the very old term uh, that is uh, taken from part of a Greek word, but ultimately what a meme is is an idea, a behavior, a style, or usage that spreads from person to person within a culture. So when you think about the larger implications of what a meme is, you know, there are memes in religion, a melody in a song is a meme. These are things that we have taken out, these units of information that we've taken out that are recognizable, that we share with each other. And there's actually an entire study of memes. Uh, Richard Dawkins, who's an evolutionary biologist, who my dad would be so thrilled I'm quoting an evolutionary biologist because he's a biologist. Um, and he never sees any overlap between what I do and what he does, but he would be happy about this. Uh, Richard Dawkins, this very well-known, very renowned biologist, uh, has studied memes, and he argues that they're actually an extended phenotype, an extended series of traits for humans that go beyond the genetic, uh, that memes are actually a unit of cultural transmission. Uh, he argues it's kind of an atomic fundamental unit of transmission of information between people. Uh, which is a really interesting concept when you think about it, if you break it down. Because in gaming, I think we're particularly good at memes. And that unit is fundamentally a human thing that we're communicating. It's, it's fundamentally a culture that we're creating. So those memes that we're building, they are the building blocks and they are a shared basis for understanding. And this is one of the things that initially drew me in as a gamer, this idea that you know, there were other people that I could share with, even though it was basic text, and we could come up with these kind of constructs that we shared, and these in-jokes, and these references, and these memes that built something larger, that we had a shorthand to talk to each other. And those common references over time build a sense of belonging, and a sense of community, and a shared language. I would argue that that language and that culture is fundamental to gaming and gaming culture. So how do we see this today? Uh, I think Twitch is a really interesting example. Um, Twitch fascinates me because now that I'm working at a communications company, we work with gaming companies, but gaming companies are only one of the segments we work with. We work with lots of other folks too. So Twitch got bought by YouTube. As gamers, we have known Twitch was massive for a long time. Uh, everybody else I work with was like, I'm sorry, who? Like they had never heard of this. Uh, Twitch kind of carved out this massive niche in gaming, but outside of gaming wasn't really known, uh, despite being absolutely massive. And they haven't announced numbers in a while, but 45 million monthly active users, um, more content consumed than Hulu and Vivo. And of that, what I found particularly interesting is that 61% of Twitch users uh, use Twitch chat. So they're participating actively and socially engaging on the platform, which is pretty meaningful. That's 700,000 daily active chatters just on Twitch. This is not even inside a game. This is around the games. This is the meta game. And so earlier this year, something really interesting happened uh, on Twitch. At least it was interesting to me, which is Twitch plays Pokemon. So some folks put together an, a, a system in which if you typed into Twitch chat, it actually created an ability to control inside the game. So you typed a command in chat, and it controlled the character in Pokemon, Pokemon Red. Um, so this image contains some of the mythology that was created through that entire experience. But essentially what happened was chat became a control mechanism. It became a way to play the game. By typing into chat, people were able to control the game. Now, this was totally open chat. At one point, there were over 100,000 people in chat trying to control what was going on in the game. And what happened was actually really fascinating because what it became at a certain point was this battle of good versus evil and this battle for people to just finish the game. And this is a basic game, old school game, but factions formed, strategies formed, characters were named because everyone's typing in chat, so the, the names were just nonsensical, but then were shortened to various other names. So you have Abby, you have Bird Jesus, you have Jay Leno, you have all these characters that were created through this input to chat. You had people then 
that were seen as the bad guys who were trying to totally derail the experience of completing the game. Thank you. Trying to derail the experience of playing the game. And they were doing that by opening the start menu, trying to hit pause, throwing items away. You know, they were trying to just do anything they could do to keep the good guys from finishing the game. But the majority wanted to finish, and 400 hours later, they finally finished the game as a community. It was a pretty cool thing, I thought. And I think what this really illuminates is that communication can be emergent gameplay. Pokemon Red, not a new game. And I would imagine when the designers created this game, there was no thought that an experience like this could happen. But communication created this type of emergent gameplay on top of the original game. When they used communication as a control mechanism, a whole new thing happened. And I think this opens up many possibilities for what, what can be created. What can you do with a game? Can you build communication in such a way that it creates an entirely new experience? You know, we think of like sandbox or open world games as created with procedural graphics or, or whatever it may be. We think of it as an open world, but what if it was actually an open communication sandbox? What if you set certain building blocks for people to communicate and allowed them to piece that together to create a totally new experience in a different way? Makes you wonder what the community would design. So one trend I've seen over time, which many people have made a joke of, but is true, uh, games often lead on new platforms. So we've seen that on the web. We saw it when Facebook came about. On mobile, I'd argue that with messaging platforms coming to the forefront, games can lead that revolution. And in fact, many of the messaging platforms are starting to look to games as an opportunity to build community, to build engagement, to build stickiness. Um, one of the unfortunate things that's happened is, you know, we saw Facebook absolutely explode as a gaming platform, which personally I was really excited about. Granted, the initial games were pretty basic, but the, the, uh, the possibilities, when you have those kind of network connections to layer a, a really cool game experience on top of it, I think that's pretty special with lots of potential. Unfortunately, what we've seen is because of changes in the platform and culture and everything else that's happened, we've chased that initial high with perhaps not the best games that copied only the initial mechanics. And you know, the platform has also tamped down innovation, which is unfortunate. So I think what I would recommend is that we need to think differently about platforms in the future and platforms need to think differently about games. We need to think holistically about the medium and the platform before we design as we move forward. It's not just about Facebook has a huge audience, so I put a game on it and I just somehow tap that audience. Like, what does it mean? What can you do with communication on that platform to make it a holistically unique experience to that medium? And I think messaging has the potential to offer some extremely unique design opportunities. So the rise of messaging apps, this is important uh, because the numbers are absolutely crazy. Everybody heard about the WhatsApp acquisition for 19 billion. Again, I think there was a lot of surprise. Uh, to me, I think this was a brilliant acquisition. The numbers on WhatsApp are mind blowing if you look at them. 500 million monthly active users, 19 billion messages sent a day, 70% are daily active users. That's insane. Now. WhatsApp is a little unique because it didn't really have any gaming application yet. Their whole thing, right? No games, no ads, no gimmicks. No implications for us yet. However, if you look at the rest of the messaging space, everybody else has a different idea. You know, these are just some of the larger names in this space right now. WeChat, everybody in gaming knows Tencent, but Tencent is not as well known outside of gaming, at least in, in North America. Uh, WeChat is their mobile messaging product. They have 272 million monthly active users. They do have a game center like game platform inside WeChat. On top of this, they have over 800 million people using QQ Messenger. If you think that's not gonna have implications for gaming in the pretty near future, I would argue with that. But there are other contenders in the space as well. So Line is an interesting one. Uh, Line has 350 million registered users, but they've taken games and content much more seriously. So it's been a real focus for them and a differentiator. And in Q4 of last year, they did over $70 million in gaming. So if you put that up against the folks you think in North America of as traditional game publishers, that's a pretty impressive number. 
they're a force to be reckoned with. Cacao Talk also 140 million users. Same thing, they have a game offering, thank you. Kick, one of the only North American offerings in this entire pile. They are building a game platform and a way for apps to leverage single sign-on and do things within their network. Tango, also local, 200 million registered users. These are huge numbers, and these are numbers and platforms and people that you can tap into. So the new game centers look different. They don't look like what we're used to. They're certainly not retail. Left is line, the right is a, is a couple of WeChat examples. But there's a major future there. And then we've got things like Yo. Surely you've seen Yo at this point. Yo is pretty ridiculous, but I have to tell you, uh, I met the, the creator of Yo a couple of weeks ago, and we had a really interesting conversation. He was actually very genuine. He said, look, I get that it was initially ridiculous. He, he built it right out of the gate because he was working with a guy, and the guy said, every time I want to get my assistant to come in, I have to text her, like, hey, come in here. He's like, I would rather just be able to hit a button, and she comes in. So this guy built him Yo, and they started using it, and they noticed it was actually pretty fun. Um, and, you know, I downloaded it just to see. And what's funny is I found I'm using it actually a lot. Um, and they've now opened up an API for Yo. And the idea is maybe when your dry cleaning's done, you can just get a Yo. Maybe when your drink is done at Starbucks, you just get a Yo. So ridiculously simple concept. But the idea is, is kind of fascinating. And I think it goes with another trend, which is the unbundling of apps. So lots of the larger social networks are unbundling. They're taking... Uh, this one app that was and turning it into many single purpose first class experiences. Uh, Facebook has talked a lot about this. Zuckerberg saying Facebook is not one thing. These are just on the right, those are all LinkedIn apps. You know, these are what the platforms are doing. And I think this is an open question to us. What, what is the yo of gaming? You know, how do we unbundle? How do we create like this very singular experience that's still compelling, but is single purpose and clean? You know, there's been such a trend to kind of bloat and such large experiences. What's on the other side of that? So the one thing I can assure you out of all of this is that publishing is going to change, and it's going to change a lot. Uh, I don't know if you all saw the announcement from Tango this week. Tango actually announced a $25 million fund for gaming on the Tango messaging platform this week. I think that is a harbinger of huge things to come and, and just kind of a first shot uh, that is going to be a movement. This is a platform and a model that you've got to invest in for the future of the industry. But the real question in my, in my mind is, why are we not talking about a gaming platform with a messaging feature? Why are we letting messaging platforms then add us like a feature? We're not a feature. <laughs> We're much bigger than that. You know, I think that what's going to be critical is that we think about how we create true, large, meaningful experiences that integrate features like messaging into our experience and own that rather than being, hey, here's a little download of an app on somebody's messaging platform. So I think there's a lot more power in that. So how to win. Ultimately, this is my suggestion to you. People want to connect. They're super passionate about your games. They're super passionate about content. You can help them. You can build the building blocks for those memes, for that culture. And it's up to you to be a diligent shepherd of your own message and your own communications. And the single best way to do that is do not cede control of your user experience. Do not cede control of your messaging and communications. Hold tightly onto that. Make it a special part of your game. Make it a special part of your experience. Enable your users to create that culture without letting it be bled to another platform that you have no control over. And perfect timing, because with that, I am done. Right. Happy to take a question if anybody has one. <laughs> had to ask. Um, we're, my, so our product layer is a communications platform. It's like a building block for communications. We're in beta right now. We're launching a next beta in about two weeks. We have over 7,000 developers on the waiting list, and we are going to commercially launch in September. If you want access, send me an email. I would love to hook you up with beta access. Free to prototype. Uh, so that was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, and we are actually a startup doing push messaging mm -hmm. and making them more relevant for uh, apps, including game apps. 
So in your view, how is that evolving, that kind of one-way, highly relevant, highly targeted communication as opposed to you know, two-way messaging platforms? So I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and actually, one of the co-founders of our company this week wrote a blog post about um, the notification being the interface. So this idea that you know, we've thought historically about a notification as just being a way to transmit a one-time message, but that really, you know, when you think about applications like Yo or simple ways to communicate, that there, there can actually be a lot of actionable stuff that happens in a notification, and that we think the trend may well be that a lot of activity is going to happen outside of apps and games themselves, and that notifications, if actionable, can become the interface itself. So I think there's huge potential there. And uh, you know, I think users don't necessarily always want to completely open up an app. You know, they've got opportunities to do things uh, through a simple interface that can still be meaningful and connect them to other people. Anyone else? <laughs> I'll use the mic this time. Uh, so, Layer is an awesome concept. Um, will you guys, I guess, one day think of living side by side with like CowTalk or Line? Because theoretically, it could be in any app. Sure. So our approach is, is we are a full stack solution on the back end. We will never have a consumer facing messaging application. You know, we want to empower developers to build great communications. So some of those developers may build communications apps, messaging apps, and use us on the back end. Others, uh, and, and this is actually the larger trend we're seeing, is that people building games, dating apps, social apps, uh, support apps want to facilitate communication and IP-based messaging inside their app, and they don't want to build it because it's not necessarily a core competency, and that's where we see our, our largest value add is enabling them to do that inside their app, but we will not build our own okay. WhatsApp type thing. Uh, what games in the market have you seen are really approaching this new trend the right way? That's a great question. So, you know, I think it's challenging. Games now are so huge. I think that you know, most messaging is really, really basic, and the games that I look to are games that are doing kind of interesting different things with the way people communicate. So games like Journey, I think, are, are really powerful in that way, in the way you approach anonymously, the way that you communicate with other users. You know, I, I like things like that. You know, the things we're seeing in our ecosystem are games and apps that enable you to share content in a way that you may not think of as a message, but actually is like a message payload. So people doing uh, shared whiteboards is an interesting one. So we've got apps where people can uh, share a photo and then draw on it. And the vector file of the drawing is sent over as a message in real time. And, and you feel like you're in the same experience. It's asynchronous messaging, but it feels uh, very real time and connected. So those kind of experiences, I think, are particularly intriguing. It's, it's this idea of like shared presence. We're not in the same place, but you can still feel like you're sharing an experience with someone. That's the kind of stuff that I'm most excited about. Thanks. We're good for time. Yeah. Thanks so much.